having discussed alternative implementations of priority queue, we're now going to shift our focus kind of away from priority queues and more into a realm of data structures. We're going to do this with something similar to a priority queue, but it, this could be about anything, and these methods don't necessarily need to be from a priority queue. All that matters is what their functionality is and what their runtimes are. So here we have some code. In this top loop, we're performing an insertion, but notice we have two loops here, so that's a little awkward. And then the bottom loop, we are extracting the maximum element. And we were told that insertions t take theta s time and extractions take theta of one time. So if we were curious, and this was a priority queue, this would be our sorted array implementation. So let's try and analyze this. I'm going to do exactly like I did before, where we have t of n is equal to the sum from s, and maybe we don't do that yet. Maybe we start with i equals one to n, the sum from j equals one to n of the time it takes to insert as a function of the size, plus the sum from i equals one to n of the time it takes to extract the maximum element as a function of the size. And now that first summation looks a little awkward. Let's try and figure out what the size is going to be as a function of i and j. So if I wanted to, s is equal to, anytime I complete a run of this loop, the j loop, that's going to increment i by one. So every time i goes up, I will have inserted n elements, plus whatever the value j is will also play a factor. So let's check if this works out. When i is equal to one and j is equal to one, we get n, eh, that's not quite right. So maybe we need to adjust this and make this And it's not really clear to me that we do this that way. You can figure this out by figuring out what is the number of insertions as a function of i and j, but this tends to confuse me a little bit and I don't really like it. So instead, let's reconceptualize the idea and ask what is the size at the start and the size at the end of this loop? We're going to do a similar thing for this bottom loop, the size at start and the size at end. And these are quantities that are a little bit easier to compute. The size at the start, we're going to say that's one. It's arguably zero, but it makes the math a little bit easier to make it one. After the first run, it will be one, so that's okay. And after the last run, the size will be n squared. How on earth did I come up with n squared? Well, we have two loops, both of which run n times and they're nested inside of each other. So it's going to be n squared. So the size of the start here has to be n squared because the size does not change between these two loops. And after I'm done running through this loop, I will have extracted n elements. So the size goes down to n squared minus n. And now this is actually a little bit easier to understand what's happening. Let us re-express the summation using that information. So instead of this awkward implementation I mentioned there, why not do t of n is equal to a singular sum from s equals one to n squared of the time it takes to insert. Insert was linear, so this is gonna be cs here, plus the sum from s equals n squared down to n squared minus n of a constant. And notice that our bounds there, the larger bound is on the bottom. I'm just trying to write it as similar to this as I can. It starts at n squared and goes down to n squared minus n. Now I'm going to rewrite that last summation in a more standard order. So I can write it as the sum from s equals one to n squared of cs. The second sum I'm going to rewrite as the sum from s equals n squared minus n to n squared of c. And now I have some nice easy summations to analyze. This is equal to, that first one is an arithmetic sum. So that converges to C times N squared times N squared plus one, all over two. Plus the next one is C times N squared minus N squared minus N plus one. 
Notice some simplification happens in that last term. So we have c times n squared times n squared plus 1 all over 2 plus the n squareds cancel and I'm left with n plus 1 times c. And all of this is in theta of n to the fourth coming from our first term here. So this is how efficient this is with this one implementation. Let's compare that exact same algorithm to an alternative implementation. So let's scroll down. Here we have an alternative implementation. And in this one, the time it takes to insert is different. So this is different. And this is different. Other than that, they are the same. In fact, this is our normal unsorted array implementation. So this is the unsorted array. And the code is otherwise identical. I know I can write the runtime t of n as the sum from s equals 1 to n squared of the time it takes to insert as a function of s plus the sum from s equals n squared down to n squared minus n of the time it takes to extract the maximum as a function of s. Normally I would need to recompute those sizes, but this is identical functions, so I already knew those sizes from before. And I know those runtimes for those methods, they were given to me as part of the problem. So this is equal to the sum from s equals 1 to n squared of a constant plus the sum from s equals n squared down to n squared minus n of the time it takes to extract the maximum, which is c times s. And now we need to be a little bit careful for this last summation. Because my bounds look similar, they both have n squareds in it, I need to be slightly cautious about how I analyze that summation. So I'm going to write out the terms of this summation to analyze it for the second one. The first summation is nice and easy, it's c times n squared, plus the last summation is cn squared plus cn squared minus one plus cn squared minus two plus all the way down until cn squared minus n. So if I want to bound this above, I'm going to bound it above by replacing each of the terms with the largest. So this is less than or equal to cn squared plus cn squared, cn squared, and all the way down until cn squared. And there are n terms in that summation, so this is less than or equal to cn squared plus cn cubed, because there are n terms in the summation. To bound it below, I need to cut it off in the middle, so I'm going to say this is greater than or equal to cn squared plus cn squared plus c n squared minus 1 plus all the way down until c n squared minus n over 2. And now I need to be a bit careful about what I do here because this term doesn't look very convenient. So let's make sure we're careful. So we have greater than or equal to c n squared plus replace every single term with the smallest. So we have c times n squared minus n over 2 plus c times n squared minus n over 2, plus all the way down until c times n squared minus n over 2. And lastly, there are n terms there, so this is c n squared plus n times c times n squared minus n over 2. And maybe at this point we can finally identify that this is also in big omega of n cubed. So the entire original algorithm would be in theta of n cubed. Notice this is more efficient than our other implementation. Our first implementation took theta of n to the fourth time. This one takes theta of n cubed time. So we added some efficiency. Why did we gain some efficiency here? Well, we gained efficiency primarily because we were doing fewer extractions than we were insertions. So this algorithm that made the insertions very efficient, while at paying a cost in terms of the extractions, tends to be a very helpful thing to do here. And one might naturally ask, well, we did the sorted array and the unsorted array. Are we going to do the heap? The heap will be down here, and I will leave that for you guys to practice with on your own. So this one is constantly left to you to work on. So this is left to y'all. 
end, that is the last thing we're going to talk about for analyzing priority queues and our brief foray into analyzing algorithms involving data structures here at the end.